All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Wilson. I'm the Director of Programming and Advocacy with New England Museum Association. Um, I am pleased to be joined by pretty much all of Team NEMA, so Heather, Scarlett, and Kayla. Um, we're going to jump right into the presentation because I want to make sure that we can fit into your lunch break, that you can go out for like a little afternoon walk, you can, you know, grab a cup of coffee after this if you need it. Um, so we're going to dive right on in. So give me a sec while we uh, while I share my screen. All right, and can folks see that? Thumbs up. Yay, great. Awesome. So just give me a sec as I go to full screen. All right. And if I have issues with full screen, uh, just let me know. Oops. You don't need to see all my little pop-ups there. Okay, there we go. So um, thanks so much for joining us for today's uh, presentation on embedding accessibility practices into your conference presentation. Um, this is one of NEMA's values and um, something that we're always striving for. This is a better practice situation, um, something that uh, as an organization, as a field, there's always work that we can be doing. So thank you for taking the time to prioritize this as you are working on your presentations. Um, first and foremost, thank you for being a speaker at conference. It's amazing. Our conference is as good as the presentations and the um, panels and sessions and workshops that are, um, are submitted every year. So thank you for offering up your expertise in the field, um, for tri tripping down to, um, to Newport this year and joining us. I'm hoping that it's going to be a very large, robust conference. Um, this is a record-breaking submission year for us. We had 132 sessions uh, proposed, and I think we're capping at about 85 this year. Um, so we're super excited for all of our speakers. All right, so today's game plan. Um, we're gonna talk a little about the, pre the prep work. So the work that you're doing right now in advance of your session. And then we're going to segue into delivering the content the day of. So that sharing is caring. What are some things uh, that you should be doing when you're in the midst of presenting your content to people? At the very end, I'll share my contact information. Um, most of you already have it, but in case you don't, it'll be there. And then we'll hopefully have a couple of minutes at the end for Q and A. All right, so first and foremost, prep work. So what you should be doing now in the months leading up to your conference, um, or up to your session. So as you're, if you're building a presentation um, and you're building a PowerPoint, here's the quick format basics. Um, if you're using text, which most people are, the font should be at least a 28 point. I think that this presentation is probably at a 38. Um, we will have projectors and screens in all of the rooms, but if your uh, font is at at least a 28, that means that it's at a good size when it's amplified and projected out to the group. Um, when you're choosing your font, uh, consider which ones you want to use. So you have the option always of sans serif or serif. Um, so your sans serifs are um, Helvetica, Arial. There's this one right here. Um, they So sans serifs don't have any of the fancy little filigrees, right? So the weight of all of the strokes of the letters. So on this T, it's the top bar or the line down. It's all even. Um, and serif font, so this is a Times New Roman, means that the weight changes. So you'll see like this top bar goes from thicker to thinner. It has little caps, a little base over here. Um, I always recommend using a sans serif. Um, when people are reading things on a screen, it takes their eyes literally less work to comprehend and compute a sans serif font versus a serif font. So for just clarity and ease for people to see, err on using like something like a Helvetica and Arial, those are usually the most common ones. Um, if it looks like it could probably be in a printed book, I would probably skip it. It's going to create just more work visually for your attendees to, um, to comprehend. And as we all know, if you're at conference for three days, you've sat in um, eight or nine sessions, by the end, you're kind of like, oh, I've seen so much. I'm like, I'm physically, I'm energized, but I'm also exhausted. So it just takes some of that work off of your attendees. When you're building your presentation, I would err also on using high contrast colors. Um, so this presentation I'm using, I believe an ivory background and then a, a dark, like very dark, deep purple text, but think of a black and white. Um, you could also use a black background and a light text. I'm not as much of a fan of that. I think that for me personally, that takes a lot of work for my eyes to, um, to read that. But again, you want to think about that high contrast. Um, you want to think about things that are um, in stark contrast to each other so people can um, easily decipher the words from the background. I would also avoid large amounts of red text or a yellow background. Um, 
for a variety of reasons. Those can be really harsh on the eyes. Um, these are also colors that for people who are colorblind, they can have some issues with comprehending um, the, the text from the background itself. So stick with like really basics. Um, you can do a white, an ivory, a cream, something like that, and a darker color. Um, but yeah, go with the basics on that. Um, white space is okay. And then last but not least, if you're um, writing out text in a column or um, in a wall of text, I should say, shouldn't say wall of text, but if you have a large amount of text, um, the more space, the better. So use a 1.5 or two spacing between lines. This is about a 1.5. And you can see it has an airiness in this list. Um, that means that if you're sitting um, further back or if you have somebody who is um, visually impaired, they can, um, they have more, uh, ability to, um, or leeway, I guess, in the lines and how, um, how they could overlap. And I'll have an example later on of like a really tight packed serif text and you can, um, start to understand why something like that could be a little, um, dense and chunky to read. For your content, less is better. Um, focus on the key points of your presentation. Um, you don't have to write out your whole presentation in your slides. You have a set of notes. You can write anything and everything in your notes for yourself. Um, but really, like, what are the impactful things that you want your attendees to take away? Um, I also recommend road mapping. So creating a quick outline at the beginning of your presentation. So that gives people a sense of where your talk is going. Um, and I say that for a variety of reasons. Some folks um, like to know, like, okay, we're starting here. And then we're going to go one, two, three. And I have three things that I'm going to learn out of this. Other folks, they want to, you know, set up their notes in a proper way. Um, for some folks, it's just understanding um you know we're gonna do it now this then that now this then that situation um so road mapping allows people to understand um where your presentation is going you can add like little surprises and like discoveries into your talk but giving those brief like um benchmarks as um up front really helps and then last but not least get to the point don't put a wall of text on on your screen i'll show you what that looks like in a second um Sometimes speakers will, and this is at any and every conference, this is everywhere, um, will sometimes use their slides as um, as their, their notes and what they want to say. And they'll have the tendency to refer to that and read exclusively from the screen instead of like giving a broad overview and then talking uh, either from their notes or extemporaneously from them. Um, in your notes, you can do anything and everything that you need to support yourself but really the screen and your presentation is for your attendees and what they need to take away. All right, so here's that wall of text. So I took our um, conference title and then the um, description from our website. These are the first three paragraphs and I put them pretty much as a wall of text with minimal spacing between the lines in a separate font. And I'm talking now and your eye is probably already trying to comprehend, am I reading this text? Am I listening to the speaker? What am I doing? Should I, where, where does my brain go? This is why I um, advise people to not necessarily put this wall of, of text in. If you have a presentation that has a quote in it, give people a minute to read that quote, just like give them the 30 seconds to a minute or read it out loud for them. Um, but I would avoid doing this for like 17 slides because people aren't going to, um, if, and it's natural, people aren't going to know, do I listen and take notes off of what's being said? Do I try to copy every word from what's on the screen? I know that I'm like that if I'm taking notes, I try to sometimes copy the whole quote and then I'm stuck taking pictures. Um, so just consider like, what is the most impactful use of each slide present, um, each slide of your presentation? All right. So if you are using any type of audio and visual, this is a little bit more rare at our conferences, but I do wanna cover it. Um, if you have a speaker who is calling into the session, they're using Zoom, or if you're playing a video, um, enable closed captioning. This allows anybody who has, um, who's deaf or hard of hearing to engage with what's being said or spoken um, in, the, in the, either the call or in the presentation. Um, I find this really helpful. This is something that uh, if you're using Zoom, I'll talk to you beforehand. Just let me know if you have a Zoom um, conference attend or uh, conference speaker. We can talk about what that looks like. But this allows everybody in the room to access it. So not just the people um, who can hear what's being said, but also those who may not be able to, so they can also engage. If you're using pictures, um, and most people are in presentations, think about which images you need and which ones inherently support your goal. 
Um, sometimes we, in presentations, like to add a lot of different pictures and make it really what we think is visually engaging. That can also be overwhelming and trying to comprehend all the different parts and pieces of a, of a presentation um, slide. So consider what your images are and really hone it down to the ones that are necessary and then skip the ones that aren't. And for the images that you do use, um, include some descriptive text. So that's usually like one to two sentences that describes that image. Um, and that allows anybody who may not be able to see it visually, and I'll talk about that in a sec, um, the different components of that, who may not be able to see it, access that image still. And then last but not least, if you're using graphs, um, simplify them, make them really easy to comprehend, hone in on that relevant data, and be prepared to explain the information from that graph um, in one to two sentences, like really break it down of like, here's what the takeaway is from this graph. I think we've all read in newspapers and in magazine articles or online a lot lately, like you see a graph and you're like, I, I there's too much going on. I can't take this in easily. Um, so really think about what that takeaway is for the audience member and how you can impart that information. Make sure it's easy to understand visually, but that you're also supporting it verbally. All right, so we're gonna skip back up to pictures for one sec. Um, so I have included an image with some descriptive text. So at the bottom is a descriptive text, just a quick statement that says, a white woman with long blonde hair is standing in a museum gallery that has three paintings on the walls. Her back is to the viewer. She is looking at a large picture of bright yellow flowers. So I wanna include this um, for two different reasons. One, um, if you're including images in your presentation, it just takes a quick 15 seconds to add what that description is of the image. Um, that's all it is. It can be two to three sentences, one to three sentences that just lays out what's visually happening. And that means that anybody who is unable to see the picture um, for whatever reason, um, that it gives them that uh, ability to start to imagine it in their minds. This also means that if you're sharing your presentation later and you're sending this out and you're emailing to people who are attendees or to other folks, um, anybody who may not be able to see um, to, uh, it either has low vision or is, um, is blind, be able to use their screen reader to also read the text out loud to them. So by adding this text at the bottom, you're also enabling this as later on to be accessed by people um, either in their phones or tablets or in their computers. All right, so that's kind of the prep work. We're gonna segue now into delivering your content day of. First and foremost, don't make assumptions about who's in the room with you. Um, we can look out into a crowd of 20 people, 100 people, and assume that we know everything that's going on with them. Everybody brings their lived experiences though into their space. Um, don't make assumptions about what people's needs are, um, what their abilities or disabilities are. Um, consider every way to support as many people in your space as possible. I know that that can feel really overwhelming, um, but that's why it's really important to start thinking about this in advance in the months leading up to the presentation. All right, so some better practices and better practices because this is always something that we could be working towards. All right, so utilize your microphone. Every room at the conference will have at least two microphones. Um, and they will be handheld mics, so we have some flexibility. Um, all right, so microphone practices. Even if you're a loud speaker, I'm usually a loud speaker. I can, I've been a walking tour guide for a long time. I can bring it up from the gut and I can really project, still use the microphone. It just, it's easier. It means that you're not spending 60 or 90 minutes yelling, which is a lot because that's what you're doing. You're speaking from this, like this diaphragm area. Give yourself a break, use the microphone. Um, also that means and ensures with amplification in the room that attendees can hear you throughout. Um, I don't have a microphone at home, unfortunately, so I'm gonna improvise with a spoon. Um, when people are using microphones, they have the tendency to think that the microphone has to be like further from their face. Like, you know, it's gonna pick them up if it's a good like three, four, five inches away. Unfortunately, microphones aren't that sensitive. So when you're using a microphone, the microphone has to be pretty close to you. So my, the spoon is pretty much hitting my, my lips. It's like right there. It feels invasive. I know it's not the greatest, but when you're using the microphone, um, have it closer to you than you think. Um, it's going to feel like it's right up against you. So I know that my my back, my background is blurred. So hopefully you can see this. Like this is very, very close to me. Um, it's going to feel like you're going to hit your teeth on it. You won't. If you do, it happens at the end of the world, but it's going to feel pretty close. So really just like lean into it. 
Um, and then also ask attendees if they can see you and hear you. Um, it's always okay to just say the presentation at the beginning of the presentation. Like, if you can't hear me, if you can't see me, just like raise your hand and let me know. That's okay. Like invite them to give you that feedback. So that way um, nobody's kind of left in that moment of like, ah, I don't know what's being said. I, I can't engage. Like give them that liberty to be like, hey, I can't hear you. Could you say that again? Could you, you, could you lean into the microphone? Um, I also encourage people to speak at a comfortable and measured pace. Um, so slow down a little bit, take a deep breath. You know, um, we sometimes when we get a little nervous, we can start to talk from our throats and we can start to go really, really fast. And da, 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 da. That's actually what I'm doing a little bit today. And said, slow down a little bit, take a good breath. It's going to be shorter for you um, than you think. Um, it's not going to seem like you're like you're breathing for five minutes. Take a deep breath and talk from your chest um, and just talk comfortably. You're giving a presentation on the stuff that you know and you know it really well. When you're... Um, Talking to your audience, face them and refrain from covering your mouth for a couple of different reasons. If you have anybody who um, is deaf or hard of hearing, seeing your face and particularly seeing your mouth enables them and engages them um, in a way that allows them to have access to what you're saying. Also, if you have anybody who's a non-native English speaker, this is a really key visual component. Um, having access to the way you're saying words and the way your mouth is moving allows them to maybe decipher between two words that are very similar. Um, so really like focus on your audience. Don't do the turn away and look at your screen and go over here. They're not going to hear you as well and they're not going to see your face. Also, don't block the screen or on screen captioning or the interpreter. Um, sometimes we get a little kinetic. We want to move around. We want to like be in the midst of things. Um, you know, make sure that you're aware of sight lines. Um, so how people can either see if there is a signing interpreter or if there is any captions happening on screen, how can you best enable people to see it? It's usually by stepping aside and being out of it. Um, and then I always find this is super helpful. If you are taking Q&A at the end, repeat, repeat questions back to the group. Two purposes. First, it makes, uh, makes sure that you know as a speaker that you're comprehending what's being asked of you so you can answer properly. And then second, um, it means that everybody in the group can hear. So during the Q&A, the audience may not have a microphone. So you're the one that's going to amplify that question for folks. You're the one that's going to uh, be able to repeat things back so everybody can hear. All right, and the last few bits of best, uh, better practices, um, provide description of the images on the screen. We talked about that a little bit. Um, if you're playing a video, also give a little synopsis beforehand. It doesn't have to like tell every single detail of it, but you know, two to three sentences about what's going to happen so people are prepared in advance. Um, that way they can just kind of shift their minds and start thinking like, oh, okay, so here's how it's going to fit into um, the presentation. If somebody is, um, is deaf or hard of hearing, they can also start to um, shift their brains to going like, oh, okay, here's, you know, I'm going to start um, thinking about this, and I know that I'm going to have to shift into reading um, closed captioning. If you are doing anything in the room, um, so if you're like taking a poll, if you have people raise their hands and like getting a sense of who's in the space, just call that out to people. It doesn't take long, it takes three seconds. So if you're saying like, oh, you know, of this room, we have a hundred people here, half of them are raising their hand. That gives anybody who may not be able to see audience participation access to like, oh, okay, here's where we're at. Like I can, I can start to visualize like where we are percentage wise. And then last but not least, if you have multiple speakers in the Q and A, um, remember to just state your name at the beginning. So if somebody asks you a question, you just be like, hey, I'm Jen, I'm answering for NEMA, blah, 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 blah. So that way um, a voice and a name are assigned to each other. Um, and that gives some clarification in the Q and A. All right, I have a clock on the side. We're at 1222, so I wanna leave some couple minutes for Q&A. This is my contact information. Um, you can reach me at either email. Um, some folks I think today are the facilitators and the, the moderators for the session. Some are the panelists. So for those of you who have an email, great. Um, Jennifer.wilson at Um, Those of you don't, who don't, you're gonna hear from me at some point in the, um, in the upcoming months. I will start to be annoying, I apologize. Um, but definitely take these down. You can ask me any and all questions. Nothing scares me. Um, I'm here to help you. And then Q&A. All right. So let me stop sharing my screen. And if we have any questions, I am happy to help, happy to answer.
Oh, thanks, Scarlett. <laughs> And you can feel free to drop any questions into the chat field or unmute yourself, whatever works for you. Oh, you're so welcome, Courtney. My pleasure. I love doing stuff like this. Hey, I'm glad that was helpful to you, Kathleen. And I'll send details out to everybody. Um, my plan is just for folks. Uh, I am making the giant schedule for conference this week. So I have written out all of your sessions on index cards and I'm mapping literally on my floor with my dog. Um, and then hopefully next Monday and Tuesday, I will be emailing everybody um, these notes um, as well as your schedules, um, just a heads up. So you'll get a follow up on all of this too. If we don't have any questions and I think we're free to go. Oh. Sounds great. Um, and Stacy, yes, I will be in touch with you very soon. <laughs> um, great. Wonderful. Take care, everybody. Stay cool. And I'll, I'll be in touch very, very soon. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>